So today is going to be a very theory heavy day, as if every day isn't. And the topic of today <clears throat> is that we're going to learn how to write inversus canons, or what's sometimes called mirror canons. And to do this, we're going to have to learn some theoretical principles first. Some things that we might call inversus harmony or mirror harmony. And it's very similar to what we learned with contrary motion. So I'm actually going to make a grand staff here. We're going to put it in A major. Why A major? Because the common tone, the common ledger line between the two is C. Which means that this is going to be our tonal axis around which we flip everything. So now we have a visual symmetry on the grand staff. That is the grand staff and it's going to be in A major. Now, before we do anything, we're going to have to buy into something the Romans said, which is, I believe so that I may understand. Now, you may not believe me about this, but first to understand this theory as we go on further, you'll have to believe me when I say that dominance can appear without their roots. Meaning that if you have something like this, and it resolves to one, we are not going to call it seven. That is, well, good. We're not going to call it seven. We instead are going to call it five without the root. That is called a rootless five. All right, we say rootless five flat nine in this case. If this went from here to something like this, we would call that seven because it's a circle of fifths. It resolves to three. So these are called rootless dominants. And the justification for them is that the, you look at the harmonic series, the most prominent partials, it's going four into dominant chord. And this is the theoretical basis for all of Western music. And so that's why they call this natural dissonance. And you can pretty much do anything to a dominant chord because acoustically it's almost always applied. That's why you don't have to prepare the dissonances. That's why you don't have to prepare the seventh and the ninth on a dominant chord. This is the justification for it. It is what distinguishes the second style from the first style, at least in some ways, not always. All right. So are there any questions about this idea of a rootless dominant? Uh, I don't know if you can hear me clearly. It's okay. Yep. yep. Well, I don't have a question. I have just a comment that I um, I do adhere to this way of, of viewing things, although I, I see some people disagree, but I think it works. And it works on a purely acoustical level. And I could give you an example in um, Cesar's Frank uh, Sonata. Yes, please. Uh, I know there's a place where there's a big dominant chord that has all the tones of the dominant possible, more or less. I think it goes up to the sharp 11 or stuff like that. And since it's disposed in exactly the same shape as the harmonic series, you can really very clearly hear the, the missing fundamental. Yeah. And yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's there. I mean, I don't know why some people will think that theoretically is wrong, but it works. So. Yes, yeah, the French had a name for this called sous entendu, which means heard below. Uh, and this, actually, Peter Van Tour touched on this. I asked him about it, um, and he says it's you know, a theoretical principle for it, actually. He was far before, uh, earlier than Rameau, which people often think is the origins of this understanding, but it's, it's actually not. In jazz, you guys have a similar understanding. You guys call them rootless voicings, although sometimes it's justified because sometimes the bass has it and you don't have to play that, but sometimes it's not. And we can get into this more at the end of the club, but this is actually the origin of augmented sixths and tritone substitutions in jazz. And there's a very deep reason for that. Yeah, this is, this is just a theoretical principle that we have to buy into to believe so that we can understand something that happens later with mirror harmony. Are there any questions about that? So today, all we're gonna do is we're gonna play a game. We're going to call the top rectus, the bottom, the inversus, oops, wrong color. And all we're going to do is we're going to see how Roman numerals invert. You guys already know this to an extent. So here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, sen. We don't say seven. Sen 
Now, if I invert them, what do I get? I get a behavior that is similar. I can invert them similar. Uh, I can invert them visually. So I can just make sure that it is reflected like this, just entirely visually. So I chose this staff, these clefs with this P. So these inversional relationships are very similar to intervals. Unison inverse to a unison or to an octave. Same thing as one, two to seven, three to six, four to five, and so on. All right. Now, what if our canon in the inversus modulates? What happens then? What if we are in A major and we modulate to the dominant or to the subdominant? Well, let's see. <clears throat> I'm going to write all the Roman numerals in the inversus. And I'm going to go ahead and do the subdominant. All right, so we have in D major. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to invert these intervals over the tonal axis of A, because we are in A major here. We have now modulated to four. What's going to happen with the Roman numerals when we invert them in the key in the bottom. Well, I'm just going to copy out the symmetry visually to be able to get. Well, that's interesting. So one here, so if we're in D major, which is four, that's obviously going to invert to five. It means that this is E major, all right? And this is one in E major. This is seven in E major. This is six, this is five, this is four, sorry. This is three. This is two. Because we are in E major, we need D sharps. All right, D sharp, D sharp, D sharp. Well, that's very interesting. The Roman numeral inversional relationship has been preserved across the modulation. So in A major, two in D major will invert to seven of E major. Now, this is a very important thing because you might be writing your canon, you might think, Oh, I've got an accidental on the middle note here because I have a chromaticism. So then you might think you're supposed to put an accidental here, but that wouldn't make any sense. That's actually not a tonal language. What you have to do is you have to invert tonally, and that tells you where the accidental should go. In this case, the accidental goes on the bottom note. So there isn't a direct correlation between the position of the accidental in the inversus to the rectus, or from the rectus to the inversus. Are there any questions about that so far? And not only between the chords, but the fourth goes to the fifth as the tonality. Yes. Does it work for other tonalities as well? Um, well, if you go to F major, for example, that's three, what will that invert to? I'm sorry, I'm, I was thinking of D major. If you go to uh, F sharp minor, which is six, six in A major, three. that will invert to three. That will invert to C sharp minor. Oh, that's very nice. <laughs> yeah. And all the Roman numerals will be preserved. So one in F sharp minor, tonally inverted around the tonal axis of A major, will invert to one of C sharp minor. Seven of F sharp minor will invert to two of C sharp minor, if you're doing it all with respect to A major. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. What else does this tell us? Well, this is a very interesting thing. Now, if we return to A major, and I decide to do five of five, so that I do this. This is five of E major, resolving to five. Resolving to five. What will this invert to? Well, let me go ahead and play the game of symmetry. So what this inverted to is what we do is we take both sides of the Roman numerals and we invert both sides. So now this is four of four. All right. So four in A major is D major. Four in D major is G major. So we need the G natural there. So you see how the D sharp was answered with that G natural. That's why you need to invert both sides of the Roman numerals. All right, so if you take five, if you take five of three, five of four, 
five of five, five of six, avoiding two and seven right now just for pedagogical reasons. What these will invert to are four of six, four of five, four of four, and four of three. Just a game, it would be vice versa. So if I did five of three down here, I would get four of six. Is that clear? Are there any questions about that? Go ahead. Basically, every plagal cadence becomes an authentic cadence and the reverse. Ah, that is actually the next thing that we're going to talk about. You always anticipate everything I'm going to say, Pablo. You're brilliant. Sorry. Oh, no, no, it's pointing it out. It's, it's perfect because you anticipate everything I'm going to say because you're, you're thinking critically about the essential thing. So that's brilliant. That's, that's the part of brilliance. Um, so that's awesome. I, I love that you asked that question. But before we move on to answering that question, are there any questions about, uh, about this concept of how we invert triads and how we deal with chromaticism? Uh, just, just sorry, it's, it's not a good question, but uh, I think it will probably work really differently if you pick chords with four notes. Yes, we're also going to get to that. <laughs> you're sorry. anticipating all my questions. No, no, it's perfect. I love that you're asking that. We're getting to all of them. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. All right, well, if there aren't any questions about that, let's address what Pablo just said. What's really nice is if we have plagal cadences. Uh, I mean, uh, authentic cadences. We are in A major, all right? I'll go ahead and write out the... So what's really nice is if we have a plagal cadence Play the game. An authentic cadence resolving one, five to one, and we need that because it's just part of the, the style. We need five going to one, and we want these strong cadences. It's a strong cadence. If we modulate to some place, we want to have an authentic cadence in the new modulation so that we can establish the new key, not a playable cadence. But hold on, if we have five going to one, right? This is going to suck because then we have four going to one, all right? So are all our plagal cadences, are all our authentic cadences going to be plagal cadences in the inversus? That is, is the inversus going to be inherently weaker than the rectus? Well, there's actually a very elegant solution to this, all right? And it starts with what we began today on. If I remove the root, and I do five nine. And I remove the root, and I'm just going to invert these guys symmetrically. I'm just going to invert the spoken pitches. Now you might think the X goes there, but the X is not being sounded, right? So we can actually put the X down here, and we get the same chord. And that is five nine. So you can have dominance resolving to one in the rectus and have dominance in the inversus as well, as long as you remove their roots. And we can do this for any secondary dominant as well. So if I decide to do a five and four, all right, and I remove the root. This is rootless five of four, five nine of four. The rootless dominant, and it has to have the ninth in it, or else you, you lose the third. Well, actually, you can omit any part of the dominant. But this part is going to remain the same. We're going to have rootless five nine, but it's going to go to five now. All right, let's go ahead and write it out, see what happens. I need to. All right, my accidental would go like this. I would have. G natural for D major. And I would have D sharp for E major. So rootless five nine of four resolves to rootless five nine of five. And that's 
And that's the bulk of what we need to learn today. Now, Pablo has also pointed out an interesting problem that we might have. If I, an A major, decide to do one seven, probably you should, probably should never do something like that. If I, do, if I decide to do one seven, this is not going to invert to one. The inversion is going to be shifted down a third. The sixth. So if you add dissonances like sevenths, uh, you will shift the Roman numeral analysis, which is okay, but I highly suggest avoiding that for right now until you have better grip on just consonant harmony and how to control it. In fact, the best strategy is probably to write the inverses and rectus of the canon and then write three voices around it. That's often what Bach does. All right. The other thing is doublings. So some people say that you cannot double the fifth, and you can always double the root, right? But if I double this like that, what am I going to get in the inversus? I'm going to get a doubled fifth, all right, and vice versa. If I double the fifth up here, I'm going to get a doubled root down here. The only thing you can really double is the third. The third will remain the same because of the symmetry of the triad. If you do this, you will get a double third in the inverses. So you have to watch out for doublings. Of course, never double the third on the dominant. You can be lenient with these kinds of things. Everybody has different beliefs about doublings. Now, people also say that you can omit the fifth. But guess what? If I omit the fifth, it will shift up a third when I invert it. So now I'm going to get this. This went from one to three. So what we have to conclude here is that we have to strongly imply the entire triad and do it in terms of consonant. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a quick little canopy. All right, let's see how fast we can do it. And I will try to throw in some things. All right, so. All right, not the prettiest example, but it's a proof of concept. So I'm going to go ahead and analyze this. This is 1. This is 4. This is rootless 5, 9. This is 1. Now this is rootless 5, 9. That's 3. This is 3. All right, and this is rootless 5, 9 of 5. 5. All right. Let's go ahead and see how this is going to invert. Notice how I handled the accidentals. We have one, so it's a five. The root was five, nine, two, one. All right. Now five of three. Root was five of three. Converts to rootless five of six. Six. Rootless five nine of five. Converts to rootless five nine of four. Four. All right, and you don't play these things at the same time. All right, with the mirror canon, this is played after that. All right, and then you would write the accompaniment underneath both lines put together. So four bars in total. So it would be played like this. This, I would place this right after that and I would write free accompaniment around it. So something like sorry. Uh, 
I can put the roots in the bass in the, in the unaccompanied um, voice. Schubert, Mendelssohn. All right. Any questions about that? Was it clear? And notice that I always implied the entire triad. The entire triad is always implied. <clears throat> I didn't put in any dissonances except on the dominance. You can put those in, but you just have to be really careful about them, and it's better to put them in a free voice. Are you guys ready to write one? The accompaniment, uh, uh, did you mean it's a canon one, which means we should uh, uh, take care for the next measures as well? Can you say, I don't, I don't can you say your question differently? Um, yes, for example, you played the rectus, the blue one uh, first, uh, then the rectus stops playing, uh, continues playing. What happens? Yeah, so you play the rectus. All right, so. That's it. Mm -hmm. Now you move on to the inverses. So you don't play them at the same time. So by the same voice, so to say. By the same voice, yes. Okay, okay. So I'm going to set my timer for 10 minutes. You guys just have fun. Set my timer for 10 minutes. And challenge yourself to modulate the places and all this other stuff. All right. There goes the timer. How was that for everybody? <clears throat> Do you have any questions? Did it go all right? Did we have to put the inverses in the bass or in the right hand in the G cliff? You can just keep it right in the right hand. I did the uh, I did the treble and bass left just for visual reasons, so that things were clear visually. Uh, but it's usually it's just flipped around itself in the same register. Mm. But you can flip the voices even more than that. Are you happy with your result? And you said that we had to um, include every note of the chord. For example, if I started with uh, one chord, I should include. A, C sharp, and E. If you want to, if you want to have a complete harmony in your in versus, you need to imply the complete harmony in the rectus without it shifting roots, unless you let the roots take care of it in the accompanying voice, three voices. Yes, it makes sense now. I guess no, it didn't go well for me. I encountered many problems uh, in the harmony. I guess yes. What kind of okay. problems? Well, I had planned to go in the rectus one, five, and the sixth chord, and uh, but I didn't imply all the notes. I had melodic uh, lines, for example, um, la so la si do re do re mi in one voice, and uh, in the in, uh, in verses la na 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 na. Yeah. So and, So yes. Would, that would be what is implied in the in verses. No, no. Um, a, B. And... Somehow, I cannot sing it accurately now. I don't have the piano near me, but um, it's that. Um, the harmony had problems. That It just takes practice. And uh, this theoretical understanding that we just laid out. Feel free to still send it, even if you're not happy with it. So we're going to learn from it. Anybody else have any comments about that? So uh, with the diminished, you have to use all the nodes as well. Yes, usually that's an implied rootless dominant okay. note. Okay. Yeah, and because the diminished is symmetrical, it should invert the same way. Let's go ahead and take a look at a piece from the rep. Let's just go ahead and look at this animation view courtesy of Thuru Bach, who is holding the world on his shoulders. 
So here, you have the subject. He plays with the rhythm a little bit. And this forms an entire fugue. So he takes the entire fugue and he composes it as a rectus, four voice rectus, all right? Then all the voices come in, yada, 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 yada. We get the point, Bach. Keep going, keep going. All right, now the inverses. Now it's completely flipped. All four voices are flipped. And now it's up there. All right, you'll notice up here that at the beginning, we had Ray La, D A. Now that is answered with La Ray. All right, so this is a tonal inversion. You'll notice in some points we'll actually keep the roots of some dominance, but you'll have to see how they invert to the inverses. Otherwise, he usually will omit the root. But oftentimes, he uh, does not have the roots of the dominant. So yeah, that's the interesting thing. Actually, you'll see right here that here he decides to put it in an inversion for the final cadence of the bar. And this is really just a pedal tone, so we can just count it and see what he does. There will be a A in the, in, no, this is, yeah, here, it's also an inversion. Very interesting. So he decides not to end on a perfect, on an authentic movement, uh, probably because of that reason. All right. So yeah, that is, just watch the animation again. You can be in awe of it. Have that. And flippity flip flip. Versus. It's an entire canon, written, uh, an entire fugue written as an rectus and inverses. Sorry, it's not still not clear to me if you are allowed and when and how to uh, use the root of the dominant implied. Yeah, yeah. So in the earlier contrapunctuses, or contrapunctuses, I don't know how to say it. Um, he omits the root consistently on the dominant. However. In these, sometimes he preserves the root, but you have to understand that it's not inverting the way that you would expect. If we look at this here, we have the root. Right? But let's see how this inverts in the inversus, inversa, however you say it. It doesn't quite invert the same way that you would think. Inverts to four, and one can say that this is actually functioning as a pedal tone above, also, if you wanted to apply the dominant. So, but you'll notice on the, on the large cadences that he'll almost always omit the root of the dominant. Otherwise, he's thinking that it'll be, he treats it like a pedal tone if it's there, so that he can justify his pedal tone, pedal tone in the inverse, in the inversa. Sorry, I think it, no, I, I think I get a, a whole more or less of the idea. I still have to see them to digest, I would say. But I think one of the possibilities would, would be sometimes just live with the fact that, that one uh, authentic uh, motion will become playable and just live for the very special places where you need a final cadence. As you said, then you will meet the root and you, you won't have any problem. Yeah, absolutely. That makes that makes sense to me. I think that's a good uh, that's a good explanation for it. Um, so yeah, that is the idea. So Juan, why don't you just go ahead and play the amount that you would like to uh, of the rectus, which starts, and then we can play the inverses.
play as much as you want for the inverse set. Okay. The whole thing's flipped upside down. Bach, uh, Bach put the bass in the soprano and the tenor with alto, exchanged these voices? Yes, in this case, because it's three voices, he decided to take the bass and the soprano, flip them, and keep the alto the same. Okay, he kept the alto the same, okay. Mm -hmm. But the alto is also flipped, but it's in the same register. Okay, is anybody can share their canons from today? Can we share the first canon, which is not the... Oh, yes, yes, yes. And so you guys you can also share your warm-ups. Please do so. So here is John's Ioannis's. the idea right this is a wonderful canon <clears throat> so it's a canon in contrary motion um it's not in tonal contrary motion because you have one answered by six so it's in it's in uh it's in free contrary motion right so we have which is very interesting actually i like that very much it's kind of like there's a transfer revolution between here and there so, yeah very nice And the entrances are all fine. There's no voice leading areas that I can spot off the top of my head. And this is the workout, so no, no certain questions, no. Cool. All right. So I get a sense that everybody is sick and tired of cannons at this point, and so am I. So today is the last day that we did cannons. So next week, we're going to begin invention, which is very exciting. And after that, we're going to do fugue. We're going to study how to write different inventions and different types of inventions. And you'll notice that canonic technique will play an enormous role in writing inventions. I haven't covered all the canons. I haven't covered how to do augmentation or diminution. We might circle back to how to do that. But are there any questions about any canons that we've done? We're all good? Perfect. All right, we'll practice your canons. And next week, I will see you for inventions. That's it for today. I'll see you guys next week.